Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Searchlight Church Online. Right there in your home, why don't you stand and join us as we worship the Lord together. Father, thank you so much for the privilege to worship you and be in your house today. God, receive our praise as we worship in Jesus' name. Amen.
search the world But it couldn't fail me Left empty graves and treasures that fade are never enough And you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Yeah.
exalt you in this place today. Lord, we worship you today, God. Lord, you're so worthy of praise. God, you're worthy of glory. You're worthy of honor, Lord. Just receive everything that we bring to you today. God, thank you that you fight your, our battles for us, God. We're grateful that we're always victorious. God, that we don't have to wonder if you're on our side, God. We always know that you're there. God, so we align ourselves with your purposes and your mission, God. God, there's never a question when we find out what you're doing, God, and we get on your side, God. You are our champion, God. Would you just continue to receive our praise, Lord, as we, as we worship you? Shout. 
with the one who has conquered all. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, and I am who you say I am. Crown me with confidence, I'm seated in the heavenly place undefeated. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated by the power of your name. I am seated in the heavenly With the one who has conquered it. He has all the power. He is undefeated. Now you this morning may feel like, well, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I have all the power. I don't feel like I've won every victory. You may be searching this morning. And Jesus Christ is the one who will light the lamp before you so you can see. Maybe you've been going in the same circles all the time. Almost like a, sometimes we feel like a small animal in a maze, you know. Every day is the same. Well, we're going to pray this morning. We're going to pray for your needs and the needs of the people that you love, that are on your heart this morning. But may I suggest this morning that the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you about coming out of that maze. You know, if you're doing the same thing every single day and you're not getting where you want to go, maybe God is speaking to you about a change. So as we go to prayer this morning, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And maybe he already has through this worship time that he wants you to do something different. He's got a good plan for you. He's got victory for you but it has to be his way. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that there's none like you. I thank you, Lord God, that you have a plan, God, for victory in us. God, that you want to, don't want to see us defeated. God, you want to see us on top, Father. Lord, you want to see us be in the head and not the tail, Lord God. Father, help us, Lord God, to find the new way, God, that you might be showing us, God. Lord, to break loose from the old things, God, and let those things go. And Father, Lord God, give us that newness, Father, for you are the one that gives us new life. You are the new builder, God. Lord, you build us, oh God. You Sometimes you tear us down a little bit to build us up to where you want us to be. But Father, open our hearts that we might hear your voice and understand your ways. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship him. He's worthy. Let's get our hands together for this last one. Darkness run full color But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over registered in heaven and my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm testifying this is my testimony this is my testimony The 
sons and daughters By the blood and washed in water Sing the praises of our spirit, son and father Our God will finish what he started Everybody, good morning and welcome to Searchlight Church Online. If I haven't met you before, my name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Searchlight, and it's my privilege today to welcome you and also to share a couple of announcements with you. First things first, we want you to go ahead and fill out your digital connection card. You'll find a link for that card right there next to this video. Uh, if you are a regular attender and this is your home church, just let us know that your family was here in church. Uh, indicate that on your card and uh, share as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. We'd love to send a little gift home just to say thank you for um, worshiping with us today. We're, we're really glad that you're here. The connection card is also really the best way to keep in contact with us, with the pastors and the staff here at the church. Uh, it's the best way to let us know if you're interested in taking your next steps in your spiritual journey, like water baptism or uh, getting into a life group or getting on a serve team. Most importantly, the connection card is the best place to let us know about all the cool things that God is doing in your life as well as the prayer requests. Every week we pray for these things and uh, so let us know what you need prayer for. We would love to join with you in praying, we'd also love to join with you in, uh, in celebrating all the cool things that God is doing. A couple announcements that we want to make sure that you're aware of. First things first, as far as Searchlight Kids, we are coming back with Kids Ministry in September, full swing. Um, but in the meantime, we have three special dates coming up this summer that we want you to be aware of. August 15th, August 29th, and August 12th. On each of those Sundays, we'll be having some really special things during the service for our kids that are uh, kindergarten to fifth grade. And going to be special events outside. There's some water activities. Um, we got like special snacks and food and games, plus some lessons for the kids. And so 
uh, especially those dates. If you have kids that are Searchlight Kids age, uh, kindergarten up to fifth grade, make sure you mark on your calendars to not miss church. And that's August 15th, August 29th, and September 12th. And then after September 12th, we'll be meeting weekly for Searchlight Kids. Secondly, August 15th, we have water baptism. So we're really excited. There's uh, six or seven people that have already decided to get water baptized. And so that's going to be Sunday evening, uh, August 15th. Just in a couple of weeks from now, we'll be down at the beach in Long Branch, uh, probably 6, 630. Uh, we'll give you some more information about that next Sunday. Uh, but it's going to be a great time to worship together. Um, uh, it's always awesome. You can go to our Facebook page or our YouTube page, uh, and you can watch some of those videos um, also on our uh, church website. Website. You can go to the media tab. You can watch some of the videos of previous water baptisms. It's an awesome time. And so if you haven't done that yet, make sure you sign up and we can get you involved. So uh, August uh, 15th, Sunday night, make sure you plan to come out outside at the beach and worship with us and celebrate with everybody that gets baptized. Lastly, uh, for four Sundays in a row, starting on August 15th, um, we're going to be having different missionary guests with us. So really excited. Every Sunday, we'll have a different speaker. Some of them are serving in foreign mission fields like Cambodia, and others are serving right here in uh, New Jersey, like at Rutgers University. So uh, we got missionary guest speakers. going to be awesome. Great time to come out and hear what God is doing all around the world. So I want to encourage you to make sure you don't miss church coming up. Uh, well, we don't want you to miss church ever, but coming up especially some cool stuff going on, right? So at this time, we want to enter into our time of giving. We want to say thank you so much for your faithful giving and just encourage you to continue uh, to do that. Three ways that you can give. First, uh, you can mail your offering in to our church administrative offices. That's Searchlight Church, 1 Main Street, Suite 203, Eatontown, New Jersey, 07724. So you can stick that in the mail and send that to us, and we'll be sure to get that and get it deposited. Secondly, you can go through the church website and use PayPal. And the third way is the Tithely app. You can download to, that to your smartphone or your tablet. It's the easiest, most, most convenient way to give. I would encourage you to do that as well. But regardless, thank you so much for being faithful with your finances. And we appreciate that as we continue to reach and teach people to live and love like Jesus. So before we give, before we go, move on to the service, uh, let's just stop and pray for a moment. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege of giving. And so, God, I just pray right now that you continue to provide for every need that we have as a church, that you would provide for every person that calls search like their home, just continue to be faithful. Uh, and, Lord, we pray that you would multiply every gift as we continue to use it for the furtherance of your kingdom as we reach and teach people to live in love like you. Thank you for providing for us, and we just pray you bless the offering today and bless the rest of our service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right, now, right now, guys, give it up in the comments for Pastor Tim as he brings part five of our current series, Faithful. Hey, good morning, and welcome to Searchlight Church Online. My name's Tim, and I'm so glad you joined us for church today. Whether you're watching live on August the 1st or whenever you happen to tune into this, I hope it's exactly what you need today. We are in the middle of a series called Faithful. In fact, it's week five of six weeks. And if you've missed any of it, I hope you go back and catch up on our YouTube channel, on Facebook, wherever you're watching. I hope that it helps to encourage and build your faith. But this whole series, Faithful, fueling your faith in a world that's on empty, is about building that life-changing, death-defying, really active live in their faith. Not only how to get that faith, but how to grow it, how to protect it, how to follow Jesus in a way that gets you through the true ups and downs of life, because we know that life is never as easy as we would hope. And so faith that not just lasts through the good times, but survives and thrives through the difficult times. Now, you're watching this online, but uh, at 10 a.m. on August 1st in our outside service, I actually get the privilege of uh, preaching on a day that we're dedicating my daughter, Ellie. So Ellie is just a little bit over 10 and a half uh, months old, and she's the joy of my life, and it's such a privilege to be her dad. And so uh, in writing this sermon, I was kind of thinking about what are some of the things that I hope would build her faith. And so for the next couple of minutes, I want to give you a sermon that really I'm going to spend the rest of my life as a father trying to instill in my daughter. If, if somebody asks me, what do you hope your daughter knows about faith? This sermon is a little bit kind of the lineup of how you get faith, how you grow faith, how you keep faith. And so I hope it, it helps you to grow in your faith. I hope that it challenges you. And uh, today's just a special day for me. So I'm excited to get to preach to you. Now, we all know the kind of faith I'm talking about, the faith that we want, the faith, we wouldn't call it that we're jealous of, 
but we all wish we have it. We see somebody who lives confidently through difficulty, who seems so sure when things seem so uncertain. We all understand that amazing faith, and we've probably said to ourselves, maybe not out loud to the person, but we say, I wish I had faith like you. I wish I had that kind of faith. We recognize great faith in others. And so the big idea through this whole series is that that kind of faith doesn't just happen by accident. The faith that we all admire happens through a process. And we can all have faith like that, but we actually have to be willing to put in time to build it, to cultivate it, yes, to practice it day in and day out. And so in this series, we've been talking about five faith catalysts. Catalysts are things that spur. They're things that when mixed in, make something grow, make it expand, make something happen. And so we've been talking about five faith catalysts that will actually help us foster and grow this incredible, lasting, powerful faith in Jesus that we all really want, if we're honest. And so if today is your first time, let me give you the 30,000 foot, foot view recap of what our faith catalysts are. The first one was the practical teaching of God's word. We said you need to be in a church that practically teaches the word of God, not just what it is, but how to apply it. Not just know a scripture verse or post it on Facebook, but actually follow that scripture in your real life. The value is in the application, right? We know this with paint. Paint doesn't do any good sitting in a can. If you want your dining rooms to look fresh, take the paint out, put it on the wall. It's the same with our faith. We can know it, we can have it, but we have to apply it. And practical teaching of God's word is one of our great faith catalysts. We have to know what God has said before we know how to live, how God has called us to do. The second faith catalyst was personal ministry, right? We say at Searchlight that saved people serve people. If you've met Jesus and he's changed your life, then we serve others. We simply give God back what he's given us. It's whatever talent or gift or passion. He will use what we have, how big or small, he will multiply it, give it back to us, and let us use it for, in ministry for his glory and to grow our faith. Now, this is difficult because it will require us to push past our inadequacies. But when we do, we make space for God to do miraculous things in and through our obedience. When we see God moving through our lives, that grows our faith. Last week, I missed being with you guys. I was with our good friends over at Long Branch Covenant Church. They send their greetings, and so I had the great privilege of preaching there, but Pastor Chris gave you the third faith catalyst to have confident, life-altering, gritty, real-world faith, and you might remember it as providential relationships. We say this all the time. You can't do life alone. God puts people in your lives, and they change the direction in good and godly ways. God puts people in our lives that actually bring faith, uh, raise up faith in us, that help us grow, that keep us accountable. And so when we see God moving in other people's lives, other relationships, it's a little bit easier to trust him with our life, right? Because we see it do it for other people, and we'll come back to that a little bit later in this sermon. But we said that the people we let into our lives affects how we live out our faith. It's so important that we have people around us cheering us on, loving us, challenging us, being there for us because real community is built around real providential relationships. And Pastor Chris wrapped up with this warning that people drift from their community of faith before they ever drift away from their faith. And so if you want to grow your faith, you want to be encouraged through difficult times, get in a community who loves you and who loves Jesus because that will help you grow your faith. And God will use you and your relationship to people to grow their faith. So today I want to give you the fourth faith catalyst, but first let me tell you this universal principle that we need to understand before we get to the catalyst. So if you're following along, you can click on the link in the description of the video or right here in the comments that you pop up. You can click and download the note card and fill it in, come back to it later during the week. But here's your first overarching big idea. It's doing the things no one sees that leads to the things everyone wants. It's doing the things no one sees that leads to the things that everyone wants. It's no secret, right, that success is not just about the end, but the process that actually sets you up for success. You know this. It's a discipline. There are good habits. There's self-control that gives you the kind of life that everyone is jealous of. It helps us to avoid regrets. I was thinking about that this week because I went back to the dentist for the first time in a little bit. It wasn't like emergency surgery or an emergency root canal or something. And they did a cleaning, and they said what I knew they would say. Hey, uh, have you been brushing your teeth every day? I'm like, well, most days. Have you been flossing? Well, kind of. And they said, well, guess what? You have cavities. Why did that happen? Because I lacked the discipline to do what I was supposed to do. Because I grind my teeth and I refuse to get one of those little bites you're supposed to sleep with. Because I lacked the self-control to do what is necessary. I was too lazy to do what I ought to do. And now guess what? I pay the price. I pay the price for the pain in that chair and the finances it's going to cost me because I lack the discipline to have the health that everybody wants. Think about someone who's helped you maybe be disciplined. Have you ever gone to the gym where you had like a gym buddy, right? You had an accountability partner. Maybe you had somebody who's like, 
calling you every night like, hey, what did you eat? Did you have a salad or did you like go to Domino's again? And there was a person maybe who kept you kind of on the straight and narrow. Now, if that ever happened to you, have you ever hoped that that person doesn't call you? This happened all the time. Back when I was in a shape besides round, uh, I used to go to the gym with my brother all the time. And he'd always call me to let me know he was done with work and say, let's go to the gym. Now, I hated that phone call. I hated his ringtone. I hated seeing his name come up because that meant work. And mostly what I would hope is that he wouldn't call me that day. He'd send me a text like, hey, too busy, bro, can't make it. Because guess what? Then I wasn't going to go to the gym. I wasn't going to put in all the work to get the results that I really wanted. But here's the thing. If I kept skipping that, I would stay in that shape of round, and I would be very sad. Now, luckily, he worked me hard, and we actually ended up uh, with great results. And I had really good-looking wedding pictures, and one day I will get back to that again when I'm that disciplined again. But it's so true that we need discipline to actually get to the end goal we all have in mind. But this is also kind of true. What we endure often becomes something to enjoy. What we endure becomes something to enjoy. We understand that when we put in the work, it doesn't matter what your attitude is. It doesn't matter what your motivation is. That's not related to the outcome. If you grit your teeth and just do it, you still get the results, right? I hate cardio. If I stand on a treadmill and just start running and screaming, I hate cardio. As long as I keep running, I will lose weight because my motivation, my attitude is not related to it. You don't even have to like discipline to get its benefits, but when you actually do something disciplined, when you exercise self-control, when you make good and godly decisions and start to see the benefits, don't you start to enjoy it a little bit? Man, I didn't like going to the gym all the time, but I really liked the results. I liked the way it looked. I liked the way it made me feel. Like maybe you've eaten healthy and you know that it makes you feel better. You have more energy. Like it's it's a better time in your life, but you had to endure the process to get the results you like. We know this with diet. We know this with our job, right? Sometimes we endure our job till that paycheck arrives and now we enjoy it, right? We know this with exercise. When we start to see those gains, we start to enjoy what we formerly only endured. And this is also true with our faith because people who have the kind of faith that we all want, they have these faith catalysts. We don't always see them, we don't always know about them, but it's the things they're doing behind the scenes that no one sees that gets the kind of faith that we all want. At some point, they endured something that they now enjoy. They went and got practical teaching that gives them handles on how to live and love like Jesus. They tried personal ministry. They trusted God with their gifts and used them for his kingdom. They positioned themselves to have God-ordained relationships that sharpen and challenge and encourage their faith. And they have this fourth uh, faith catalyst I want to give to you today. I simply call it this, private spiritual disciplines. Private spiritual disciplines. Every healthy faith story that I've ever heard always includes some part of this moment where they said, there was a time when I was so tired, I just picked up the Bible and started to read it for myself, and it made sense to me. I was so desperate that I started praying to God, not just when things were bad, but every day. I kept coming to God and having a conversation with him, right? There was something in my life where I proactively started seeking God, and he started to show up. Every faith story has these private disciplines that so many of us tend to avoid, that lead to the kind of confident walking in faith that everybody wants. It starts with private spiritual disciplines. To get the things everyone wants, we have to do all the stuff no one sees. Now, let's be honest. Right now, how many of you have such a hard time with discipline? Let me know in the comments. You can put a frowny face. That's fine. That's me. I am bad at discipline. I have hardcore ADHD. I am type B. My office, right now, I went to look to find something. It took me 15 minutes to find a paper I was looking for because it's mostly just stacks of books and other papers that I'll be looking for in the future because discipline doesn't come natural to me. Discipline does not run deep for me. And so here's what discipline really looks like, even for us type B people. It's a pre decision. It's pre-deciding something. Discipline doesn't always look like a clean, narrow column or like a type A personality or everything being in its place. Discipline looks like pre-deciding to do something. Because pre-deciding says, this is my priority. I'm going to do this thing no matter what. I'm going to commit to this decision come hell or high water. I'm deciding ahead of time what I'm going to do before the circumstances that are sure to derail me. Right? This is when people first start going to life groups. I'm going to go to life group even if they aren't serving snacks. 
I'm going to go to Searchlight, even though I know it's Pastor Tim's week, and he preaches a little bit longer. And even if I don't get something out of it, I know there's a discipline of going and being in church because the discipline, the repetition, builds my faith. It's a seed that I'm planting in my life to grow. And Paul says this about seeds because that's really what private spiritual disciplines are. They're seeds that start under the ground, that grow into the things that we all want, but all seeds start small. And so talking about seeds, Paul says this in Galatians 6. Verse 7, it says, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Here's my question to you What is your faith growing? What is your faith growing? How does it look? Is it healthy? Is it wilting? Did you forget to water it? We all know I kill every plant. I killed succulents in my house. I'm no good with plants. So when it comes to faith, how's my faith doing? It's doing exactly how the seeds I planted, the seeds I pre-decided to plant, the work I just pre-decided to do, set it up to do. If you don't like how your faith is growing, go back and look at the seeds you planted. Go back and look at how you've taken care of your faith. The spiritual garden that you're responsible to tend. My job as a pastor is to equip you for good works that God has designed ahead of time for you to do. And so I'm equipping you with the gardening tools to take care of your own faith, but it all starts with the seeds that you plant. And then you have to go back and do the work. You have to pre-decide to take care of your faith. And this discipline, it becomes a lifestyle which feeds our faith and it grows. It becomes this thing that feeds itself almost, but it doesn't happen by accident. It's something that's a result of a pre-decision, a discipline that's worth the outcome. We endure it until we enjoy it. And so here's your next major film that I think you need to understand. Your personal relationship with Jesus is worth it. All this work, all this planting of faith seeds and discipline, what, what's the outcome? Is it going to be worth it? Because that's all the question, right? Anytime somebody tells me something I should do or I should invest in or where I should go, my first question is return on investment. If I get up off the couch and go there, will it be worth my time? If I get up and go up, get off the couch and go over there, do I want to see that person? Will it be a good experience? Will they have good food? What's the return on investment? I want to let you know that your personal relationship with Jesus is worth the investment, the pre-decision, and the discipline. Now, depending on the church you grew up in, that's kind of a strange phrase, your personal relationship with Jesus, because it may be personal, but it's not really private. Because how your faith actually grows, the things no one sees, actually affects the things that every, everybody wants. And so your actual personal, private relationship with Jesus will affect the entire church. And so this is what we're challenging everyone to do. The church is only as healthy as the church members. And so I want you to know that it's worth investing your time and discipline into your relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus never called anyone to believe in him, right? You can believe from where you are, from sitting on the couch, eating Cheetos, watching the Olympics, not being impressed. Now, the reason we all love Olympic gymnasts and divers and all these crazy people, right? I know we sit there and we're like, I could do that. No, you can't, right? But we watch these people at the pinnacle of their being. They're on TV for like three minutes, and they've been training their entire life. It's the things that no one sees that have led them to the things that everyone cheers about. And faith is no different. What people see publicly is just the smallest bit that's above the ground of the soil. Jesus said, follow me. You can't do that from your couch eating Cheetos watching the Olympics. Maybe you can do that in a life group. I don't know if that's somebody's life group. Olympic Cheetos eating life group. I could win that one. But God didn't say just believe in me. He said follow me, which requires a relationship, which requires getting up and moving. It requires self-control and good habits and boundaries to protect that relationship and discipline. This is daily. It's personal. This is literally saying, God, I want thy will for my life, not my will for my life. And then making choices, discipline choices that honor him instead of just what you want. And so with spiritual disciplines, there's always this external, right? That's what everybody sees. They want to see how pious and humble you look, right? Do you carry a big Bible? Like, how can they tell how holy you are? Some people, right? Some people, it's not you, I know, but somebody right now who's watching, right? The only time you read your Bible, it's like the only time you go to the gym when you post about it on Facebook, right? You didn't really go to the gym unless there's a picture of you in front of a mirror with like this giant weight. That's how some people are with scripture. They only do things publicly for them to see. But if you don't have any internal, actual, personal motivation for life change, personal relationship between you and God, between you and his word, between you and his voice, it'll become this external routine that grows cold. 
you will eventually become uninterested if people don't praise you and notice you. And sometimes our faith gets like that. It's just an external motivation, a rote routine, and that leads us to become cynical of the people around us, of the church. It leads us to become judgmental because we're better box checkers than everybody else. It leads us to kind of just have this this ability to write everybody off because we're so much better. That's what happens when we focus on the external. Don't raise your hand or point, but how many of you actually know somebody who's been in church for a long time and they're just not a nice person? We know that just because you're in church doesn't mean you're in Christ. You can say you're a Christian, you may go to church, but dang, if you're not living and loving like Jesus, everybody knows. Because you have an external motivation, not an internal one. And if you don't actually love Jesus, then going through the motions of pretending you love Jesus will make you miserable. You may be religious, but if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus then you're never going to actually grow past the point that people can see. Churchy is not Christ-like. If there is not a personal side to your faith, then it becomes rote, and when it's rote, it will become broke. I don't know where I heard that, but I stole it from somewhere. No relationship, no love, no passion, no faith. You'll walk away from church, and chances are you'll probably take some people away with you because it's just boxes to check, not a father to love. And so your personal relationship with Jesus is about internal motivation, not just what people can see. Maybe you're listening now and you lost your faith or you're listening and you feel like you're losing your faith. Isn't it true that the first things to go in your faith, in your relationship with God, were these personal connections with the Father? It became all about routine, what people see, and who doesn't look like Jesus that you were able to point out because we weren't tending our garden, we were just watching everybody else's. And if you aren't fostering and developing spiritual, personal disciplines, we're no longer following Jesus. We're just taking that label Christian, right? We say at Searchlight, we exist to reach and teach people to live and love like Jesus, because Christ followers live and love like Jesus. Many people say they're Christians. Why? Oh, my mom was a Christian. My dad was a Christian, right? Mom was a Lutheran. Dad was a Methodist. We go to church Christmas, Easter, you know, not Buddhist, not atheist, must be a Christian, But without a personal relationship with Jesus, you're just pretending because the foundation of a Christ follower is their relationship with Christ. I said at Long Branch Covenant last week that the reason we're called Christians is because in Acts chapter 11, the non-Christians, right, the people of the town said, you guys look like little Christs. Christian, like little Jesuses, you won't stop loving people for no reason whatsoever. You're generous, you're kind, you welcome, uh, you know, foreigners and aliens and sick people, you take care of orphans and widows. You look too much like Jesus, I'm going to call you little Christ. That's what it means to be a Christ follower, to live and love like Jesus. And it's that intimacy with Jesus that allows us to actually say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. I'm living for your glory and not just for my decisions. If you don't invest in that personal relationship, and some of you maybe are wrestling, I just want to challenge you that if you don't follow Jesus daily, your relationship will grow cold and your routine won't save you. This may be your story, that you admired a Christian, you wanted what they had, but when they weren't involved in your faith anymore, your faith fell apart. Your mom, your pastor, your grandma, somebody you admired who had great faith, but you can't borrow your faith. When it's just you and Jesus, he needs to become enough. Not just rituals and ideas or belief, but you have to follow him for yourself. And so, uh, how many relationships have you heard where people said, I just drifted apart? And I've heard this multiple times where somebody said, I just drifted away from my relationship with Jesus. And so, here's the thing about that. Jesus didn't move. We have to understand that we have to be cultivating our personal relationship with Jesus. And the more time we spend personally with him, the more we love the things he loves, the more we're bothered by the things that bother him, injustice, right? The things in the world that we know are not how they ought to be because God didn't make them that way. The more we love Uh, The more we live for his approval and his glory and his kingdom, that's all from a personal relationship with Jesus. And so what are these things? I keep talking about these private spiritual disciplines, and none of them are going to blow your mind, but I want to give you three spiritual disciplines that you all already know, but they show up in every faith story of somebody who has this living, active, gritty confidence in God that overcomes all circumstances. Let me give you three things to cultivate, to work on personally, to help you grow your faith in a world that's running on empty. Three faith-building disciplines. Here are these things that if we invest in our faith daily, day in and day out, they will pay big dividends of great faith that stand up to circumstances and criticism and eventually, yes, even death. Maybe you'd call it something different, but I'd call it this. The first one is daily devotions. Daily devotions. Now, devotions is a weird word, but It's something I learned as a kid. I don't even know where I picked it up, but daily devotions, time with God, reading his word, hearing from him, and talking 
with God the Father, right? Reading the Bible, pick it up and just start reading. When's the last time you just picked up the Bible and started reading a gospel, the account of the lives of Jesus? When's the last time you, you picked up the Bible and you're like, hey, first or second Samuel, look at this guy, David, there's crazy things going on. Honestly, they couldn't make a show about that. It would be like X-rated because some of the stories in the Bible are more explicit than, the ga- than Game of Thrones. Luckily, the ending of our book is way better. The thing is, daily devotions make time with God. They make time with the Bible, with his written word. Because here's the honest thing. Listen, it's okay, I'm not offended. You don't remember my sermons. You don't remember any of my sermons. One day you may be flipping through your Bible and you notice something that you underlined or maybe one of the old uh, handouts that we have is in there, but you don't remember them. They may encourage you, they may challenge you, you may feel like, oh, that makes sense to me for like three days and then you move on with your life because that's how we are as people. But when you read the Bible for yourself, when God speaks to you, then that's something you take away that can change your life forever. You can actually pray and talk to the author of the book and ask him to help you understand his words. Bible reading can be hard. Let's be honest. Listen, I have a degree in Bible, and sometimes it's hard for me to approach it and say, well, what does this even mean for me? And so it's hard. It's a discipline that sometimes you have to endure until you learn to enjoy it. I was kind of thinking of it this way. Uh, The reality of parenting is diapers, Lots and lots and lots of diapers, all the time, every time. When people are like, oh, I think, you know, you need more diapers. I was like, no, we don't need more diapers. And guess what? We always need more diapers because she just goes through them because that's what kids do. And I actually, I kind of enjoy changing Ellie's diaper most of the time because it's a fun time. She's there and she's singing and she's giggling and we're playing. Now she's trying to do this like alligator death roll thing, which is way less fun. But when we're there, it's a moment for us. And we get to sing, and we get to smile. And I enjoy that, but there's one unpleasantry in the diaper-changing process. Sometimes reading the Bible is a little bit like changing a diaper for me. Because it points out all the things in my life that are falling short. The things in my life, my sin. The things in my life that make me feel dirty and filthy because it keeps me apart from God. The, The crap in my life that makes a mess out of things. Now, it's totally natural. I know that. Everybody does it. There's a book about it, right? We're all born this way. It's only natural, so let's just kind of stay in our mess. We all have our excuses to not let God change us, but reading the Bible shows us a loving Father who doesn't leave us in our mess. And suddenly, this exercise that shows me how crappy I am actually becomes a safe place to be cleaned up. Because it's a place where I have to actually crawl on the changing table, get in a position where I can have an intimate moment with my dad who can deal with my mess as he sings a little song to me and makes me smile and all be better for it when we're done. Because I let God change me through his word. Now, for some of you, that's a little bit too grotesque of an illustration, but let me explain that talking to God and hearing from God will change everything about your life for the better. But you'll never hear his voice if you don't make time to actually sit and hear him. God will prompt you, remind you, warn you, encourage you. When you invite him to speak into situations no one knows about, he will. Now listen, Jesus explains how we have devotions this way. Matthew 6, verse 6, it says, But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then the Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, it is assumed. This is not like a, hey, if you have time, or in passing, or as you are going, don't forget. There is a time to pray. Set aside time and go make time to talk and listen to God. It's great that you pray when you drive. It's great that you pray when your spouse drives. But don't just pray when it's convenient because how many of you know that if you were with your significant other and you said, listen, the only time I'm going to talk to you is when we're in the car and the music isn't any good, you probably wouldn't have a very firm relationship. You probably, actually some of you that might be more talking than you usually do and go back and listen to our relationship series, but you know the relationships can't survive just on conversations based on convenience. We have to actually have communication that we make time for, that we protect that time, that we know that it's essential to a relationship to have good communication. I don't believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of God, and so I pray. Understand that it's not the action, it's the relationship. And so that's the difference, that we need to make time for God. We find time for the things that matter. According to the screen time report on my iPhone, I spent six and a half hours on social. Now I could give you an excuse like, hey, I run social for Searchlight, so that was a work time. But let's be honest, we make time, we waste time on the things that matter to us. In fact, don't even say I don't have time. Try saying it's not important to me. Now, if that hurts and it makes you uncomfortable, make a change. Because we make 
time for the things that are important to us. When you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door, and talk to God who loves you. We hear so many voices, sometimes we have to shut out the rest to hear the one that matters. We're doing this because we want to live in love like Jesus. And Jesus made time for his father. Luke 5, 15 says this. Despite his instructions, the reports of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases, right? So Jesus was popular. We know this. He's a busy guy. He's got a lot going on, important things to accomplish. You may think you're busy, but Jesus had about three and a half years to preach a message that will save the entire world. He's busy. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness to pray. Another translation said he often withdrew to a lonely place, which means what? He went by himself. He went alone. Now listen, if anyone doesn't need to pray, it's Jesus. But he actually set the example for us to model for us how to stay connected to the Father. This was part of his normal rhythm. And you can look all through the Gospels where we find this. Again, in Mark 135, it says, Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. This was his usual behavior. How do we live like Jesus? We make time to pray. We make time to read God's word, which is his voice to us. Devotions, make time to pray and read the Bible. I love this little like part of the story, verse 36. It says, later Simon and the others went out to find him because he's been praying for so long, which I don't know that many people have been like, hey, can't find him. I think he's been praying this whole time, but that's another thing to work on. Verse uh, 37, when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Can you imagine like all these Jewish people have been waiting for the Messiah to show up for hundreds of years and now they feel like they lost him? So they find him, they're like, dude, we have religious stuff to do. Why are you praying? Understand that Jesus, the only person who didn't need to stay connected to his father through prayer, modeled it for us because Jesus knew what he was going to do. His ministry, his life, his relationship was so essential. He was too busy not to pray. And that's how we need to approach life. Before we do anything meaningful, before we start our day, before we move through things, Martin Luther famously said, I have so many things to do, I'm going to need to pray for three hours. I'm not asking for you to do that. I don't think that I can even do that with ADHD. But understand, the important things are the important things that we make, the discipline that we design. The number one question I get asked as a minister, well, to be fair, it's usually, is this a sin, and are we living in the end times? Uh, If you have to ask how close you can get, then yes, it's probably a sin. Yes, we're living in the end times for the past 2,000 years. But the most important question people ask is, what is God's will for my life? What does he say to me? And my question is always, well, what did you read this morning? What does the Bible say to you? What has God been speaking to you? Right? Stop sharing your horoscope on Facebook. Stop, stop telling me about the vibes you got from that place. Did you read the word of God? Because the Bible is not going to give his riches to those who don't dig for it. The Bible is God's written word to us that's still speaking to us. If you want to live a faithful life, give God time to speak to you and take time to speak to him. Predecide that he gets time before the meetings, before the stress, before your kid that won't sleep. Decide pre-decide that he gets time. Follow Jesus. Take time alone with him because that's the time that's going to change your conscience. That's the time that's going to point you in a new direction. That's the time that's going to renew your mind and set you up for everything else to come so that when life gets hard, our foundation is a personal relationship with God, not just the external things that everybody sees. And that's developed through prayer and reading scripture where we know God's promises and we know his character and we know he's trustworthy. When God speaks into our lives, our faith grows. I want my daughter Ellie to know she doesn't have to talk to God. She gets to talk to God. Now, I'm going to move on to the second one. Let's see if I can upset some people. The second discipline is really kind of crazy because you read all these studies and it's kind of true that when men actually start doing this thing, statistically it says they're actually bought in to church. Many men will attend church occasionally. Many men will say, you can watch my kids. They may even serve a little bit. But if you want to know when a man has bought into this whole Jesus thing, and I'm sure this is true of women too, but it's this spiritual discipline. We're going to call it percentage giving. Percentage giving. Here it is. The church just wants my money. Pastor Tim wants me to give, me, give him money so he can buy a private jet so he can go ministers, stewardesses, or whatever. Listen, the wife is the, my, my wife Erica is the breadwinner in my home, okay? And I don't see what you give, so I don't care. The only thing I know is that God wants you to give because that shows that he has your heart. When you start giving, You can find this in every faith story for every person who has the kind of confident, gritty, life-altering faith that we all want. Giving is part of their story. The one you can trust to save you from hell is the one you can trust with your wallet. Percentage giving, it's a pre-decision to invest in God's work and what he is doing in the community 
and the world. And it's about priorities. It's about confidence in God to do more blessed with 90% of your income than cursed with 100%. Because Malachi says we're living under a curse if we're not giving back to God. It says, will a man rob God? There's lots of people I don't want to rob. The last person I want to rob is God. Sometimes we view giving as offering God something that isn't his which is kind of a weird way to look at it, right? If I, I have a neighbor, he's a great guy. Paul, if you're watching, it's good to see you. But if he borrowed my lawnmower, used it all season, and then brought it back with a bow and said, hey, I want to give you a lawnmower, I'm not impressed. I'm like, bro, it was mine to begin with. You're just returning my thing that you used. Understand that God owns everything. God, everything that I call mine, God's like, mm, not entirely. Understand that it all belongs to God. Your stuff, your talent, the breath you're breathing right now that maybe you're holding because you're a little upset that we're talking about money. The idea that we give God anything is nonsensical. Everything we have is a gift from God. We return what is his to remind us that our hope is not in our sweat or our investment or our mind or our wisdom or our shrewdness. Listen to what Jesus says to people who are often on the edge of starvation, worse off than we. Matthew 6, 31 says this, So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Eat, drink, and wear. Three things that I don't think Americans, at least most of us, don't think about anymore, right? I'm hungry. I can order an $8 sandwich and pay an app $10 to deliver it to me, wherever I am. Like, drink, do you mean Wawa or Quick Check, right? Multiple layers of clothes. Like, what, what should I wear? I don't know. Let me go through these seven drawers that I have. Is it summer? Is it winter? I have a different set for each. Maybe those aren't your worries. Maybe your worry is something like, what am I going to do for a job? in this crazy economy. Maybe your worry is, how am I going to pay for my kid's college? What am I going to do with that bill I didn't expect? Jesus says, don't worry about those things. I know you're worried, and you're worried because your thought is there won't be enough. You're worried because your thought is there won't be enough. He says in verse 32, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And if you're anything like me reading that, you're like, yeah, they kind of dominate my thoughts too, Jesus. So I guess I'm in with those guys. But this is why this is a faith issue and not a money issue. Verse 32, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all you need. God knows about your bill. He knows about your kids' braces. He knows about the situation and the college fund. He knows what you need. So here's the tension when it comes to giving. It's do you believe in Jesus? That's the issue. That's the heart of the issue. Do you believe him that the Father knows your name and your need? Sometimes, honestly, it's easier to trust God that when we die, we'll go to heaven, because it's really not a thing we have a ton of control over anyway. But when it comes to our actual finances, most of us just trust God last during the panic moment. Anybody else? Is it just me? Okay, I'm just guilty of that. I'm like, God, I got this covered, and if I really get in trouble, I'll call in the Calvary. And we think that we can actually make away with our resources and our power and our ideas and our endurance, and we go, oh, God, it's, it wasn't enough. Oh, I trust you now. And God's like, why don't we just live that way all the time? Why don't you trust me from the beginning? And God invites us to live our whole lives trusting him. That's what big, bold, life-changing faith looks like, because he is enough, because he has been good in the past. I'm not going to waste my time worrying about the future. Jesus invites us to put our money where our faith is, regardless of what's going on. So Jesus keeps going in verse 33, because money is actually a kingdom issue. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Follow me all the time with everything, and I'll make sure there's enough. Giving exercises our faith because it involves letting go of the thing that most of us put our trust in, the thing that we have more confidence in than God often. It's a faith thing. It's not really about money. You can't have two bosses. You can't have two things that lord over your life. Jesus says you can't have two masters. You're going to trust God or you're going to trust yourself. Let's be honest. Nobody's sitting here going, hey, should I trust like God or the devil should I worship Jesus or Satan? Like, nobody has that thought. But all of us go, do I trust Jesus or do I think I can do it on my own? Can I make my own way? Can I pay my own way? Our temptation is to trust ourselves and the backup plan in case we're not sufficient is to call in Jesus. But if you want to live a faithful life, be faithful with your money. The invitation is to pre-decide to follow Jesus over stuff. He knows the number one contender for our loyalty is our financial security. Jesus says, trust me with that, and then it's obvious where your faith is. Listen, when Eric and I got married, and I tell a story all the time, we lived in this little apartment in Eaton Town. I worked here uh, on a volunteer basis, right? I worked at Radio Shack on commission, making not a ton of money. Erica was in, medical, or, uh, in nursing school and working at Urban Outfitters, and we worked hard, and we tithed. 10%. It wasn't an impressive amount of money, but it was so much money to me. 
As you may know, 10% may not seem like much to anyone else, but it meant so much to me. But we gave that because that was God's money. And steadily, my faith was increased, even as my budget was not. Listen, we kept eating ramen, and we had this old futon that we slept on. When Erica started working as a nurse and I started working for this window company, we started saving for a house. And guess what? We could have gotten to a house much sooner if we took 10% away from God and put it into our house. But that was God's money. And as a family, we weren't going to rob God. I'm going to teach Ellie this, that God provides for every need, that God has never let us down. I'm, I'm not lying. Honestly, you can put in the comments. I'd love to hear, what's your story of God coming through for you? One of my favorite things growing up was hearing Pastor Jim's story, right? He'd be on the road leading worship, two kids, and Sandy's at home. They'd get a bill for like $237, and then he'd come home, and like someone would be like, hey, God put it on my heart that you should get $237. You're know, like, where does that come from? But that's not unique. You see, God provides constantly out of nowhere, and your faith explodes when he comes through. All of us want the miraculous. None of us want to be in a situation where you need a miracle. And understand that giving is one of the best ways to show who you trust. We say at Searchlight, you can't outgive God. You want to see your faith explode, trust him with your money and see how he makes up the difference. Last year, no, well, I guess like 18 months ago, pre-COVID, somebody paid off what I had left of my student loans, almost $3,600, which was more than 10% of my income. Listen, I did a little dance that day. When people say, hey, has God ever come through for you? I'm like, I got a story. Now listen, I'm not saying that if you sow into this, this is what's going to come back. God doesn't promise that. But I guarantee that God will give you more than he asks. It's one of his favorite ways to show up and show off. So let's give him the opportunity and your faith will grow, but you have to pre-decide to give percentage. Last one is corporate worship. So we're going to work on our daily devotions every day, talking to God, hearing from God. We're going to trust him with our stuff. And then this last one is corporate worship, which I know seems a little bit odd because we're talking about personal, private disciplines, and this doesn't feel personal. But hear me out. Something happens personally in us when we gather corporately. It just does. There's something different when we gather with other people of like faith that doesn't happen when we're by ourselves. There's this group dynamic. You know it. You've all felt it, right? You're singing together. You're nodding along to the sermon, or you're all laughing together at one of Pastor Tim's hilarious jokes. It's a shared experience, right? That's a joke. You can laugh at that, too. But we do something together. Right now, you're sitting on your couch with the one person, and if you laughed at that, your cat's like, what's up with that? But tomorrow, when we're going to be outside preaching that live, I hope it gets a lot of laughs, and we'll have a moment to talk about because there's something that happens when we experience life together. How many of you know during the lockdowns, you at some point said, I miss church? When we couldn't gather, when there was no way to be outside, when there was nothing, you were just watching on the screen, I miss church. If you miss searchlight, what did you miss? The 37 steps that you have to come up that are crooked to come into the old brick building where it's a temperature that you didn't like and you didn't get the chair you liked because you probably came a little bit late? No, that's not what you meant. When you say, I missed church, did you miss the preaching? Because we've never missed a week of preaching. We've come in every single week and pre-recorded this message, double the work for the preaching team, double the work for the staff to come here and make sure that you guys heard the word of God. That's not what you missed. You missed the we of church. There was a we experience. When I gather with you in Jesus' name, we experience the presence of God in a different way than we experience on our own. When we gather as the church, we give up a little bit of that individualism that we love so much as Americans, right? We give up a little bit of our preference to get up in the morning and get dressed and come find a parking spot that maybe isn't convenient to sit in a chair that wasn't our first choice. But when our voices start to fade together during worship and we join our hearts and minds in prayer, there is something that happens where we become we. We are the church. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. All of you together are the body, and each of you is a part of it. Every time we all get together, it's a reminder that God is up to something bigger than just you or I. But it includes you or I. We together are the body. We need one another. God is doing something in all of us is part of his plan for the world. And we lose that sense of we and us when we isolate ourselves from the body. Remember, people leave a community of faith before they ever leave their faith. I need the discipline of gathering, of not forsaking the body of Christ. We're not meant to do life alone. The best life is a shared life. The best spiritual life, the best faith-building life is one based on gathering together to worship the living God and sharing that experience together. When we come together, we know Jesus is in the middle of us in a way that's unique and powerful, and it builds our faith. Our discipline may be personal, but it's not private. But it's not private. Now, 
Maybe you were expecting some life-shattering new like insight into this, but listen, none of this is new. Uh, we need to understand, uh, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson said, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. You know all this. You've heard all this before. The question is, what will we do with it? If your faith is not where you like it to be, it can grow. God wants it to grow. If you feel like maybe your faith is on life support and you're not sure how to get it back, let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to these seeds that we're planting. Let's pre-decide to not wander away from the community of faith so they can pull us back into our faith. Here is my challenge to you. Whether you feel like your faith is struggling or you feel like you're the closest to God you've ever been, keep seeking first the kingdom of God. You never outgrow that. Keep pre-deciding to do the things behind the scenes that leads to a life of faith that everybody sees. Keep on spending time daily with God. Keep on giving and honoring him with your finances. Keep on coming and gathering with the people of God. Your faith should always be expanding to include more of God's work in and through you. And so here's my challenge as I close today. I'm going to kind of give you all your fill-ins at once, and I'll come back to them more at a time so you can see them. As a church, I want to challenge us to put these faith catalysts to the test, to work on these spiritual disciplines. I'm calling it the 45-day faithful challenge, to refuel, to not, not just succumb to this world that's running on empty, but to, f- to fill our faith tanks with the fuel of God. And these three things we have to do is we're heading into September, right? We have August. It's almost kind of who knows what the school situation is going to be look like, but we're going to be back from vacations and not traveling. And finally, it's local summer, like September is coming. Let's do something over the next six weeks that builds our faith. Now, listen, uh, we're not going to have a special revival service. I'm not going to come give you three things or pay for this cloth. Here's three things that you can do to build your faith over the next six weeks. I hope all of us will do this for the next 45 days. Let's give God the first one, the first minutes of your day. The first minutes of your day. If you want to see your faith grow, give God the first minutes of your day. Now, this is hard for me because I'm a night owl, so I'm useless in the first five minutes. So here's what I'm saying. Whatever the most productive time of your day is, give God the first couple minutes of that. All right? So if I get up with Ellie and then I'm sitting with her, and I'm, I can't get up earlier than that and drink coffee and actually talk to God because I'm still, like, just a terrible person at that moment. But whatever your first couple of moments of productivity are, whether that's in the evening when you come home and you unwind or right before bed or before you get up, whatever your first moments of productivity are, give God the first minutes of that production time of your day. The second thing is to understand that when we do that, that God will actually just drop things on our heart. I don't know if you've do, been doing your devotions lately, but the other day God just dropped a concept in my heart I'm going to use in a future sermon because I was just spending time with him. Not because I have to, not because I'm a pastor, but in the process of relationship. So give him the first productive minutes of your day. The second thing is the first dollars of your income. We call it percentage giving, right? The first dollars, God will provide for you. Maybe it'll be financially, maybe it'll be relational peace that you've been longing for, but he will always give you more than you have given him, right? Listen, if you don't give anything, here's what I want to challenge you to do. Give a percentage. It can be 1%. I don't care. If you don't give anything, just try it. Don't wait until you see a GoFundMe and you swoop in. You're like, hey, I'm here to save the day. Just pre-decide ahead of time that you're going to give back to God's kingdom. If you give something now, make a decision to try tithing. That's 10% for six weeks and see if God doesn't grow your faith. If you're already tithed, consider giving above that. 10% is actually the floor. We know that the law was one thing, but grace always demands more than the law as you read in the New Testament. So decide, whatever it is as a family, what your percentage giving will be. The first dollars of your income. And the last is the first day of the week. The first day of the week. That's Sunday. Come join us in corporate worship. We're going to keep meeting. We're going to be outside at 10 a.m. as long as the weather holds. Come join us. I know you're watching me on a broadcast right now. If you feel safe, if you feel like you're comfortable, listen, you can stand in the back of the field. I don't care. But come gather with us. We need to be people who don't give up gathering because God will speak to you during worship. God will speak to you during uh, the, the greeting time when somebody gives you a smile or if you're comfortable, a hug. God will speak to you through maybe what I think is a throwaway line in my sermon and God had it just for you. But we need to decide to come together. And slowly but surely, as we keep up these personal disciplines, God will grow our faith. If you don't believe me, go find somebody who has this gritty, confident, life-altering faith that you want and ask them if they do these three things. Because I guarantee I'm not lying to you. So over the next 45 days, would you commit to these 
three things. The first productive minutes of your day, the first dollars of your income, and the first day of the week. Listen, to start, it may feel like a discipline that you have to endure, but slowly, slowly, as your relationship with God grows, you'll start to enjoy it. And either way, your faith will grow, and it will be the fuel, the kind of life that Jesus has called you to live. It all comes down, though, to this personal discipline, building your personal relationship with Jesus that connects you to God the Father. I want Ellie to hear me loud and clear that Daddy loves her almost as much as her Father in Heaven. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, but you have a Father in Heaven who loves you and wants you to know that more every day. And the better you work on your relationship with Him, the more you plant those seeds, the more you cultivate that faith, the more He will show Himself up faithfully. Let's prioritize doing the things that no one sees so we can have the abundant, the abundant, purposeful, blessed life that everybody wants. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you as we close today. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we get to spend time hearing from you, that we don't have to guess what you're thinking or what you have for us or if you love us, but it's plain as day in black and white. God, help us to make ourselves available, whether we download you version and start reading a Bible plan, whether we open our Bible. God, let us begin to love your word. God, thank you that you are enough for everything that we ever need, that you can meet every need, God, and so we trust you with it. God, thank you for the gift of this church that we can encourage and love one another. And so, God, I pray for everyone listening, if you're maybe struggling and say, listen, I, I want to have that kind of faithful life, but I'm really struggling. I feel like I'm running on empty. Just let me know in the comments. You can put your hand up. You can put it on your connection card whatever, but I want to pray for you because all of us go through difficult situations. All of us run low from time to time, but we don't have to live in that running on empty, sputtering fume fuel of faith because God has more for us. God has abundant faith. And so God, for everyone who's struggling with that, God, I pray for your full abundance in their life. God, I pray that as they open your word, you will speak to them clearer than you ever have before. God, I pray as they pray prayers to you, God, that you would just be so close to them, they would feel your presence and know, God, it's not just bouncing off the ceiling and around their room, but God, you have heard them and you love them, God. For those of us who are struggling maybe to trust you financially, God, give us strength, give us courage. It says it's the only time in the Bible that says, put you to the test, God. Help us to trust you with our finances, with our stuff, and make you Lord of all in our lives, God. God, I pray that you would just continue to bless this church as we gather in your name for your glory. God, bring us back safely. God, I know there's a lot of feelings about gathering, but God, I pray that we would not uh, forsake the gathering of the believers so that we can honor you, so we can hear from you, so we can leave this place, this field that you've called us to. We'll get up from the computer and walk out the doors that we live in and live in love like you, Jesus, because we are the church not just to gather, but to be sent after you filled us up. So fill us with your faith. Let us walk out into the world and live in love like you, Jesus. We pray for the opportunities to love other people in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, thanks so much for hanging out with me for a couple of minutes. I pray you have an amazing Sunday. God bless you, and come back next week as we have the conclusion of our series, Faithful. God bless you. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us for Church Online today. I hope you were inspired by that message. Uh, and actually, if you were, make sure that you like, comment, and share these videos. Spread a little bit of hope. Very, very practical stuff. Thanks, Pastor Tim, for bringing that to us. Uh, and want to challenge you. Remember, guys, take that 45-day challenge and join us as we strive to see God increase our faith. Fill up our tank in a world that's on empty. Don't forget, we're meeting every Sunday, 10 a.m., right here at Seashore School, 410 Broadway. We would love Love, love, love to see you and your family back out here for church in person. And uh, guys, have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday for the conclusion of Faithful.